We're talking about the autumn feasts. The autumn feasts. In preparation for the autumn feast of Israel, let's uh, take a step back and look at the feasts as a whole. Are they merely fascinating historical occurrences? Or do they hold a deeper relevance for believers in Jesus today, whether you're Jewish or Gentile? <clears throat> Throughout the ages, God has sought after the people of Israel in order to bless them and to make them a blessing to many peoples. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. And uh, Andy could read that, please. <coughs> <coughs> Genesis 12 <coughs> 2, and, two three. and 3 yeah. I will make you a great nation I will bless you and make you your name great <coughs> and you shall be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those that curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed Amen he gave also gave Israel a sacred trust to bear his name and to be the nation from which his redemptive plan for the world will go forth. John 4:22. John 4:22. Rosie, please. <laughs> No, yeah, I've forgotten. I opened my case and you went in there. John. Right. John 4.22? Yeah. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. This plan is illustrated in the feasts that uh, God ordained. The annual feasts are actually called I'll get this right because I can't spell it, I must admit. Okay, Moedim. We, we've said this before, but uh, I wanted to give you the Hebrew uh, word, which is Moedim, being plural, okay, because we understand that by the I-N on the end, okay. <coughs> In Hebrew, it mean, means appointments, I'll just, as, as I said there. In a sense, these appointed times of the Lord. Leviticus 23 verse 4 Leviticus 23 verse 4 Please Diana These are the feasts of the Lord holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times There are two truths that the feast illus illustrates they constitute God's agenda with his redeemed people. They constitute God's agenda with his redeemed people. And the second one is they provide a biblical and historical foundation for faith in Yeshua. They provide a biblical and historical foundation for faith in Yeshua. Jesus was, as we've seen, the fulfilment of the feasts. Indeed, he is the purpose for their existence. These feasts, Sabbath day, etc., are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs 
to Messiah. Colossians 2.17. Die. Colossians 2.17. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Okay. Even as all scripture is inspired and profitable, these shadows are relevant for followers of Messiah today because they never stop pointing at him. The whole feasts are leading up to him. 2 Timothy 3.16 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So what are these feasts and how do they outline God's redemptive <coughs> program? There are seven appointed times laid out in Leviticus 23. We understand that, we've gone through this before, we're just brushing up on it. The first three free feasts illustrate the redemption accomplished in Yeshua's first coming. When Jesus came first, they, he fulfilled those three feasts. <clears throat> when he became the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John one twenty nine. John one twenty nine. Yeah. <coughs> the, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." Which is very, very interesting when you think of it. Because up to then, no one realized there was going to be a fulfillment of the feasts. And yet John points to it and, and, and points to him and points to it as the feast, saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <clears throat> and through his resurrection of course Jesus is our first fruit 1 Corinthians 15 20 please uh, Andy 1 Corinthians 15 20 <coughs> <coughs> but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep Okay, the fourth feast, Shavuot, Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, whichever one you want, like to call it, speaks of the establishment of the body of the Messiah, the Church, when the Holy Spirit is poured out at this feast's fulfilment. Acts 2, 2 to 4. Acts 2, 2 to 4. <coughs> and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. <coughs> and there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and <coughs> tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Okay, the final three feasts come in the autumn, during the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. As the biblically significant number seven indicates, the autumn feasts point out to the time of completion and paint a prophetic picture 
of the coming fulfillment of God's redemptive program. The autumn is possibly the most important time in the year in Judaism. Three of Israel's holiest days are celebrated then and all in a space of three weeks. Now, the first is called Yom Teruah Teruah Excuse my uh, Hebrew, it's not very good. It's also called the, the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. Followed ten days later by Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And five days after that, five days after that, we get Sakot. which is Tabernacles, and that feast <coughs> lasts a week. That feast lasts a week. So we can start with Yom Teruah, which is the first day of the month. It's very important that you take a note of that, because I'm going to tell you something which will ring bells. Okay. Yom Teruah is, is the first of the month. Ten days later is Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, and five days la later is Sukkot, which will last for seven days. They all have both historical and prophetic fulfillment. And following this pattern of the spring feasts, the prophetic fulfillment I reckon please I reckon will occur during the time of each feast therefore it is important that we as Christians study them for glimpses into the future as well as to gain better understanding of Jewish history now why do I say they will be fulfilled on their day. Because the first three were filled. The first three the were fulfilled so exactly on that day. Mm. Mm. So we get Passover, uh, the unleavened bread, and uh, first fruits, and then the Feast of Weeks, absolutely fulfilled to the moment. Yeah. And so therefore, I do not believe that these uh, three feasts will be fulfilled other than on their day. Yeah. I really do. So let's have a look at the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah. Where are we up to? Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. Is it me? Yeah. Uh, 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 23 to 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. 
Gentiles are sometimes confused in their studies of these holy days by the fact that the, the Lord changed the Hebrew calendar at the time of the first Passover. We've done that, haven't we? Yeah. Exodus 12, 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Okay, so what they, that they did was they kept a religious year which started in the spring and they stayed with their civil calendar which started in the autumn. Which is weird, but there we are. The people have always retained their original calendar as well as ob observing the, 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 the religious year. This is why the Feast of Trumpets is also known as Rosh Hashanah. Okay, it's the head of the year. sometimes called New Year okay and they celebrate it as a new year okay the Feast of Trumpets is a time of new beginnings now according to tradition Jewish tradition, creation was completed on this day. Therefore, Adam was born on that day as well. Okay? Also, based on the view that John the Baptist was born in the spring, around Passover and his birth preceded Jesus yeah. by six months Luke 136 Luke 136 It is possible to place the birth of Messiah on the Feast of Trumpets. These events combine to give the day its historical fulfillment. Not prophetic, but historical fulfillment. Yeah. Everybody? Yeah. Okay. Unlike other Jewish feasts, the Feast of Trumpets takes place at the new moon which is what we said yeah when there's just a sliver of moon in the night sky problem what is the problem It has to be confirmed by two eyewitnesses. And therefore, if the weather is not clear, uh, yeah, uh -huh. it's not easy to observe the rising moon and the rising of the new moon not always that way yeah for this reason the feast of trumpet trumpets has been come to known to, to be known as the feast where no one knows the day or the hour huh. 
Is it because it's the time of the year where the weather is yeah. is like that? Yeah. Mm. No one knows the day or the hour because it's the only feast which is heralded by the sliver of the moon. Remember, they didn't have a Rolex in those days. Yeah? So they everything was taken from the new moon. And there had to be two people who said, I've seen the moon. And it was there. Well, that they did that every month. And so they would after so many days they would count back and say okay well the month started then and therefore this, this is the the sixth or the fifth you, you understand okay according to Matthew 24 29 where are we up to Matthew 24 29 Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The sun, moon, and stars will go dark at the end of the great tribulation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. To signify that the most terrifying judgments ever to be visited on planet Earth have ended. Sometime afterwards the Lord will return on the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. Of the Lord's coming with power and great glory uh, scripture tells us Zechariah 9 14 over them and his arrow will go forth like lightning the Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south Matthew 24 30 and 31 Andy Matthew 24 30 and 31 Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven, <clears throat> and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the heaven. Come on. <coughs> Say that again. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. <coughs> now, please understand they imagined when you can gather when you um, the scripture says they're gathered from one heaven, end of heaven to the other they always thought that heaven was a bowl sitting on a flat surface therefore one end of heaven to the other was one end of earth to the other do you understand? Where heaven touched the earth. Okay. Alright? Other people think that the rapture of the church will happen at the Feast of Trumpets. Religious Jews believe that in heaven books recording the deeds of mankind are opened at the Feast of Trumpets for an annual review of men's behaviour. At that time God writes down who will live and who will die, who will have a good life and who will have a bad life in the coming year. These books are written are written on Rosh Hashanah. 
but certain actions can alter that decree. The Jews believe that the actions that can change that decree are repentance, prayer and good deeds, usually char charity. And these must be completed in the 10 days before Yom Kippur. Okay? For that reason, these 10 days are called the days of awe. Where each man's destiny hangs in the balance as he goes about repenting and asking forgiveness from his friends and neighbours for the sins he's committed in the past year. And he also performs acts of charity. Is it warm? It's warm enough, though. Okay, right. A common greeting amongst the Jews in the, the uh, during the ten days of awe is, "May you be inscribed and sealed for a good year." May you be inscribed and sealed for a good year. Mm. On the first afternoon of the Feast of Trumpets. It's a two-day celebration. Orthodox Jews go to a running brook or stream where fish swim and throw pebbles or crumbs they've gathered into the water, symbolizing God casting away their sins. While they're doing so, they recite Micah 7, 18 to 20. Micah 7, 18 to 20. Where are we up to? Me, I think. Okay. Absolutely. Rosie. Micah 7, 18 to 20. The, uh, Just it's, in, it's in the Bible. Yes, please. Who is a God like you, who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the, the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, yes, you will cast out, cast all all their sins. Sorry, into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers on the days of old. This is the most, one of the most eloquent descriptions of God's grace to be found anywhere in scripture. Yeah. Really is. Yeah. It reminds God of his promise to be merciful to them in the coming judgment in Yom Kippur. The fish's dependence on water symbolizes their dependence on God. The fact that the fish can't close their eyes speaks to them that God sees everything. <clears throat> this ceremony is called Tashlish, which is T A S H L I C H. In Hebrew, it, it means you will cast. A reference to the hurling the, of the iniquities into the sea, which is in Micah seven eighteen, okay, seven nineteen. Right, sorry. Four times within the span of twenty eight verses, the Lord says said to the people on earth at the time, "You will not know the exact." time of his return in advance using a form of the phrase 
you will not know the day or the hour. <coughs> Matthew twenty four forty six. Matthew 24, 42 to 44. Watch therefore, for you do not know what, your, what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Matthew twenty four fifty. For the Lord of their servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. Matthew twenty five thirteen. Watch therefore, for you know for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Four times mm. we are warned that you do <coughs> not know the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes. This leads some scholars to speculate his return will coincide with the feast. If so, the second coming will the pre be the prophetic fulfilment for the Feast of Trumpets. Prophetic fulfilment. <coughs> As we've said, he's, it's commonly called Rosh Hashanah or the Jewish New, New Year. Another thought is that because there is very little biblical information on this mysterious feast, Jewish tradition teaches that the blowing of trumpets or shofars during this feast recalls the ram's horns Joshua and the Israelites used at Jericho, and of the ram that Abraham sacrificed in place of Isaac. Scripture notes a time when Israel is gathered back to the land by the blowing of the great ram's horn. Isaiah 27, 13. So it shall be in that day, the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. Praise God. And in the new covenant, Paul explains this mystery at a time when all believers will be gathered to the Messiah. 1 Corinthians 15 51 52 1 Corinthians 15 51 <coughs> and 52 51 and 52 yeah? yeah Behold I tell you a mystery we will not all <coughs> we will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed okay 1 Thessalonians 4 16 and 17 1 Thessalonians 4 16 and 17 
17. Yep. And the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Because none of us know the exact time of this future blowing of the trumpet, the Feast of Trumpets should motivate us to readiness and service. Yeah? Any questions? We're dealing with Yom Teruah. Alright, any questions about that? Neville, you're quite happy because you asked the question. Yeah, no, so it's fine. Okay. Okay. Let's go on with the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur. How are we doing for time? Okay. So now we're dealing with the Day of Atonement. In Jewish tradition, this day is for Jewish individuals to get right with God. Biblically, it was a day for Israel to be restored to God as a servant nation. Leviticus 23, 26 to 32, please die. Leviticus 23, 26 to 32. spoke to Moses saying also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement it shall be a holy convocation for you for you shall afflict your souls and offering offer an offering made by fire to the Lord and you shall do the do no work on that same day for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You should do no manner of work. It should be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Okay. Now, let's just go back. I've done this before with you. And let's just have a look. In the Old Testament I don't want to go on with all these uh, Jewish things I want us to look at what actually happened the high priest on the day of atonement would get dressed in his regalia full dress he would put the breastplate on. Yeah? Mm. On the breastplate were tribe, twelve, twelve, tribe stones. twelve tribe. stones which represented the twelve, twelve tribes. tribes. Yeah? Okay. This is the day, the only day of the year, that he was going to go through the veil into the most holy place. Therefore, 
there were two goats, two lambs. It doesn't matter whether they were goats or lambs. They were young goats, young lambs. And they were taken and they cast lots for which one fell to the Lord and which one was slaughtered. He would lay his hands on the one and confess the sins of Israel and it was then taken out into the desert and let go to die in the desert. Next week we will see what they did at um, <coughs> at the fulfillment, shall we say. I'm talking about when they're in the wilderness. The other he would slaughter and pour the blood into a bowl. He would then proceed into the most holy place once a year he would take the blood sprinkling the blood before him as he went he would go behind the veil and into the most holy place and there he would stand in front of the mercy seat and sprinkle the blood seven times on the mercy seat the Shekinah of God was between the angels. Everybody with me? We've done this in the feast of uh, in, in the uh, the tabernacle. So God looked down and saw in the ark the two tablets of the law. He looked down and saw the commandments. But when he sprinkled the blood. God looked down and saw the blood and didn't see the commandments. We understand, tradition tells us, that they tied a rope around his ankle. Because if the sacrifice was not accepted, he would be killed immediately. And they would be unable to go in there to get the body. So they would pull him out. That was the idea. And what he had was he had bells and pomegranates around the bottom of his tunic. One bell, one pomegranate. One bell, one pomegranate. This, this, it, what we would know as a pom-pom so that the bells wouldn't clang together because that would be a clang therefore they just tinkled gently as he moved and they would listen and they would listen to make sure he was still moving and he would sprinkle the blood and then back out and then come and stand in the doorway of the tabernacle the whole of Israel were gathered around because they understood that this was the day when the high priest would make a sacrifice for the sins of the nation. If the sacrifice was accepted, the blood was accepted, the priest would start come and stand in the doorway so that everyone could see him and a great roar would go up from Israel because their sins were forgiven for another year. And so each year on the Day of Atonement he would do that. Now that's historical. That's way back in the wilderness. Each year they, they traveled for 40 years in the wilderness. Each year they did that. And the high priest would fulfill his task.
And the reason that he stood in the doorway was to, for them to know that their sins were forgiven. The reason that Jesus rose from the dead and presented himself alive was so that we knew that our sins were forgiven. Amen. Praise his name. That's all I want to do this week. Let's go on next week and we'll look at the further parts I've got on Yom Kippur. Okay, any questions?